You heard it. Um, I'm going to make an introduction. My name is Karen Kooni. I'm the director of the Vera List Center for Art and Politics here at the New School. And on behalf of the New School, I'd like to thank you for coming. And I'd like to thank the Public Art Fund, and in particular, Nicholas Baum, its director, for bringing the uh, Public Art Fund lectures to the New School and for having done so under the ages of um, other directors for many, many years. We're particularly delighted to have tonight Thomas Hauseago with us who will be introduced by Nicholas. And again, thank you for coming. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Um, it's really terrific working with you and, and your team to bring this, uh, the 10th series of uh, Public Art Fund talks at the New School, made possible by generous contributors, including the New York State Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Arts, to whom we're all grateful. Tonight's talk is the last in our spring series, where three artists, uh, each featured in the forthcoming exhibition Statuesque at City Hall Park, present their work and ideas. And that show opens in just three weeks on the 2nd of June. In March, uh, maybe just to remind you, I know a lot of people have come to each of the lectures, which is terrific. Um, so just to recap a little bit, in March, Matt Monaghan took us on a time-lapsed drawing into sculpture journey that went from studies in Amsterdam with Tom to musings on the problematic status of the monumental statue. As he put it with typical poetic flourish, sculpture is walking backwards from abstraction, back into a sort of lovely mortal skin. In April, Huma Baba spoke of my connection to a special kind of rawness which is found in Karachi, and to her interest in ancient and modern sculpture from Africa to Asia to the West. She spoke directly of the powerful, uh, the powerful impact uh, of the recurring themes in her work, war, colonialism, displacement, and memories of home. Now it's May, which means Tom Hausiger. Tom's talk is especially timely given his prominent presence in the Whitney Biennial and current solo show at Michael Werner Gallery. Born in 1972 in Leeds, England, Tom is now based in Los Angeles. He studied at St. Martin's School of Art in London and Der Tellier in Amsterdam. Significant recent exhibitions include Serpent at David Kordansky Gallery in LA, uh, When Earth Fucks with Space at Xavier Hufkins in Brussels, um, a solo show at Contemporary Fine Arts in Berlin, Two Face Two with Aaron Curry at Veneklassen Werner in Berlin, and the current show here in New York, The Moon and the Stars and the Sun. In any consideration of the state of the figure in contemporary sculpture, Tom is a touchstone. The vitality, ambition, scale, and invention of his work is unmistakable, and his influence on other artists profound. That much was confirmed when Matt Monaghan described how, as students together in Amsterdam, Tom had thrown down the gauntlet. We're going to do the figure now, and it's not going to be pretty. Tom's work often explores the boundaries between the two and three dimensions, the abstract and the visceral, the human and the monstrous, the monumental and the intimate. His sculptural techniques are experimental, while still calling upon the stylistic phantoms of modernism's past. With its idiosyncratic approach to construction and form, his work collapses the distinction between artistic process and the art object itself. For Tom, the projection and overlapping of armature, plaster-like tough cowl, rebar, charcoal, and rust are the traces of a figure subjected to perpetual abstraction and distortion. Please join me in welcoming Tom Hausko.
Okay, well, <clears throat> that's the best introduction I've ever had in my life. Can I just say, mostly it's like there's a guy here and he'll talk to you about some stuff. That is new realm I'm in, so I'll try my best to, uh, to do something okay or good or whatever it is. So uh, I'm sorry about, uh, can you hear me? By the way, okay. <clears throat> so this, uh, I don't know why this, this, uh, this, these words are on this thing, and it's bad because they screw up the look in the guy's eye, which is quite important. Let me see if I can trick this thing. I can't trick this thing. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I wanted to try, if possible, um, as opposed to being like, hey, this is my work, and this is what I do, and da-da-da, which I will do in a minute, but... I wanted to give you a, an idea of wh where I'm from, because as I get uh, further on in this thing, I think it's quite important, and I think um, more important than I'd realized uh, before. So I, I really want to talk about, you know, you leave a place, I'm someone who's left lots of different places, I'm always, I'm like an itinerant uh, artist in many ways. I don't, I don't fit into any scene. I've never gone to school somewhere and then built a career out of that school. You know, I've always been this kind of freak. And um, mostly that's been really bad for me, to be honest with you. It, it means you, you, you subject yourself to like a degree of alienation that, that, that's quite weird. But I, I realize that obviously I choose it. You know, that's the psychoanalytical thing of it. So this is an image. When I was a, when I was a young guy, um, I, I was born in Leeds, which is in the northern uh, area of England, and it's really uh, a place that's designed um, to to grow people who go into the military or work in incredibly uh, heavy manual labour. We're like a class, you know, in England. It's not talked about very much. People talk about the English class system but they very rarely talk about what the North really is, which is it was uh, a brilliant idea, I think, uh, to create a group of people who would do anything for you. You know, really, it's an incredible thing. And it was very weird to grow up in that because, um, you know, it gives you a view of the world that's, that's at one time very, very realistic and, and absurd at the same time. So anyway, as I grew up, uh, there was this thing called the minor strike. Margaret Thatcher had... Um, come into power, and she was a very tough woman. And she was probably right, can I just point out with all of this? But she decided to close the mines in the north of England, and mining was the like lifeline for most of Yorkshire where I'm from. So I grew up uh, in amongst and mixed in and, and, and watching this incredibly violent thing that happened. So here you have a, a miner on the right, and the line of police uh, on the left, and uh, his look, if you could, if I could get rid of that graphic, is extraordinary. And um, I, you know, you have to remember in the north, you have the, you have the history of Ludditism, which was a rejection of machinery. Um, they, they were, you know, the Industrial Revolution happened and they, they said, well, you know, we're not gonna go with it. We wanna stay with, and uh, they were crushed, of course. There's, there's a huge uh, history of failure from where I'm from. You know, it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And London says, no, you really, you're going to do it. And they say, no, we're not. And then London says, yes, you are. And then they send up troops or police, and they end up doing it. They end up going, doing what, so anyway, there was this massive, like, uh, incredible social violence at that time. And, and, and it's very hard, I think, as an American, I'm going to say something really weird and probably odd, but it was white cops beating up white guys. And uh, as Americans, that's kind of a weird concept, I know, but, but it taught me that, that cops um, will pretty much beat up anyone with the right people behind them. And it's important to know that if they're really gonna beat up white guys, they're gonna beat up white guys. That's, that's so anyway, there was this incredibly violent period as I grew up, I'm gonna try and whiz through it. The, the interesting thing was um, the miners at a certain moment were beating up the cops. I mean, they were really, you know, these were guys who were miners. They were, you know, really tough, tough people. And they drafted in police from other parts of the UK to come and, to come and fight them. This gives you an indication the, the miners built, uh, in a weird way, like uh, sharpened sticks and built them into the road so that the police horses would get like garroted. I mean, that gives you an idea of the 
we're talking about England in 1983 or four. I can't remember now. So I moved from that, and I, I'm sorry to, to jump into this. I, I always, um, I, I keep referring to this, and I, I think it's important to talk about it. This, uh, so the miners were crushed, and, and, and Margaret Thatcher won, and you know, mining was moved to another part of the world. And then you have this massive amount of very angry, very tough men who used to go down mines and dig things, and then they became soccer hooligans, is the way I, the way I viewed it. So Leeds United Football Club, uh, literally um, in the 70s and 80s, as I was a young man, like struck fear in people's heart. I mean, these were the toughest hooligans you can imagine. They were called the service crew, and uh, that, that's based on a train line uh, that went between the north and the south. It was a train, and it was called the service crew train that was meant just for employees of British Rail. And the hooligans, to avoid the police, would go on this train. They would get on this train. And they, they used to dress up in this incredible way because they didn't want to get seen. And uh, I don't know if you see the guy, but the two eyes, let's say, are Leeds United badges. And one of them says, Leeds Service Crew fighting on arrival. And I, I, I really think it's... Uh, and they used to dress like this. It was incredible. This is a... a, a they would wear these tattoos, and, and they were really frightening people. And they would take over uh, town. Whenever there was a match, they would take over town. So again, you have the, the police on the field uh, at Ellen Road, which is uh, Legion United Football Club. And you can see the fans, and, and the, uh, you can see down here the seats. They would throw the seats at, at the police. And, uh, this, this, this isn't a weird thing. This is every weekend. Do you know what I mean? This is not like, oh, my God, this thing happened. You know, we need a review. This happened every Sunday. I would wake up hearing them singing these chants, like, you know, uh, we're Gordon, you know, we're, whatever. I won't give you the chants. They're not nice to hear. So this is the Leeds fans invading the pitch and going to the, uh, to the other fans' area to provoke them into fighting and the other fans, as you can know, don't want to fight them. And there's a reason for that. Believe me, I, I lived it. There's a reason I don't want to fight them either. But my point being made is that I, um, to me, like social disorder and collapse and um, an inability to believe that there's some central law that governs you is a very important thing for me. And I, I, I'm only realizing this as I get, if you like, older. So anyways, <clears throat> I'm moving on to an art thing. Sorry about that. But it, I think you should remember it. It's something. So we used to go on holiday to, uh, to my grandparents who lived on the south coast of England. And there's a medieval, uh, no, uh, Neolithic, well, uh, Neo Neolithic uh, piece of land art called the Cern Giant. And uh, I should just point out how big this thing is. Those are cows up on the left cor corner there. This is carved into, you know, the white cliffs of Dover. The, this is chalk underneath the, the grass. And uh, this is made, they're, they're not really sure, but it's probably a couple of thousand years old. And uh, it's a fertility god, as you might gather, uh, from the club. And, um, <laughs> and still to the day, now I drive to Dorset from Leeds, and I'd, I'd go past this from the, from the motorway you get this fantastic view of this thing, and I think it's the first piece of art that I loved. I really thought this was an amazing thing. And I think, again, because of its scale and the fact that it seemed to land from nowhere. And still to the day, people copulate within the confines of the, uh, of the, of the chalk, because it's seen as, you know, if you're looking for babies, that's the place to go, apparently. Here's Sean Ryder from the Happy Mondays. Now, as I was growing up, I had a very good friend who played for Leeds United Football Club. He was the most successful person I knew. He was a younger brother of my best friend, and we all thought this guy was like, you know, second coming. And he played for Leeds United, and so he would, could get us into these clubs in the north at the time. It was the beginning of rave culture. You've got things like Hacienda and uh, the Favisham and things like this. So we were able to meet, you know, I remember watching Happy Mondays and the Stone Roses. I don't know if you guys even know these bands. I'm acting like you know them. But I, I, I think this image um, says a lot about me. 
And, um, you know, and, and I'm ashamed of that. Don't get me wrong. But it, but it really says happy Mondays were like uh, the last um, gasp of something. You know, and they burn and they failed again. Failure. Let me just, it's going to be a big theme of this thing. They failed terribly. You know, they lost everybody money. It was like a nightmare. But they, they were fantastic. And, and, and I, I remember... Um, being struck, I couldn't believe uh, the Happy Mondays at the time when I saw them live. I just couldn't believe that energy. It was an incredible, despairing, brilliant animal energy they had. So then, uh, uh, other than the CERN giant, you know, the CERN giant was important. But for me, uh, you know, the Beatles were probably the first instance of something avant-garde coming into my life, you know. Uh, I think that the, they had that. Uh, they were also from Liverpool, which is the town over from me. And um, my dad was an enormous fan of the Beatles. Uh, and I used to look at those album covers. I thought they were just unbelievable, you know, as a young man. And then my dad played me uh, one day, and I, I can remember it. I can t smell the thing. I can remember the carpet on the floor. My dad played me I Am the Warrus, the, the song I Am the Warrus. And I, I think that changed my gestalt in the world. I, I, I was not able to uh, go back to the person I was before I heard that song. And I remember that. And I think that this is where we have to be really careful about being too tough on art and being too tough on artists because, you know, the world is a horribly brutal place. And without art, I don't know really what, what we have to point at that's really great about it other than art. And so um, I think at that time in the late 70s, you know, uh, hearing I Am the Walrus changed my whole view of the world and I think made me an artist for both better and worse. Because suddenly, like, you know, you look at your family and you're like, who are this group of people? You know, why am I in this shitty place in the north of England? You know, I'm an artist. I was like nine. I just want to point out, I was nine, and I knew I was an artist, and I knew Leeds was shitty. I had to go through 10 more years of knowing that. But, you know, God bless John Lennon. He, he woke me up to it, right? So another massive, iconic thing for my generation was Star Wars. Um, some of the, again, some of the first figurative uh, images, I mean, you know, someone made Darth Vader's helmet. You know, they designed it and they made it and it was based on a Nazi stormtrooper, but it was also based on, you know, African fang sculpture, if you get into it, or, you know, Mali and this. So it's an odd American, crazy view of something really profound, which I love about America. It's like, we're going to mix a fang sculpture with uh, an SS stormtrooper helmet and we're going to make a sci-fi movie. And as an, as an English person, I was like, fuck yes, love it. <laughs> Boba Fett, amazing character, strange, enigmatic figure for my generation. Looks like a Jacob Epstein sculpture. I mean, I hope Epstein gets a cut of Star Wars. I guess he doesn't. The thing, amazing, you know, raging male thing. You know, I showed you the images of Leeds. This spoke to me. Uh, I'm, I'm also ginger. He's ginger, you know what I mean? <clears throat> This is a comic, 2001. These are called Judge Deaths. They're, they're, and they were like the most terrifying thing I'd ever come to in my life. I don't know if you guys know Judge Dredd. Judge Dredd was meant to be the good guy. These were the evil judges, and they, they killed you, basically. And if you look at the references uh, in this, it's everything from Bosch through to Picabia through to whatever. And I was absorbing this. You know, this, this, These were my images. I loved them. I poured over them. I, copied them, I thought about them. Swamp Thing, another brilliant uh, creation. Don't know who did it, but it's, it's, it's a fucked up and great thing. And uh, again, this is how uh, the figure was manifested to me. I didn't know the stuff behind the scenes in this. This was how I viewed you making a figure. So I'm gonna go to William Blake. Now, quite early on in my life, this is a lucky thing about coming from England. Uh, that somehow William Blake came to me. I think it was a teacher, or a, uh, I don't know. I don't remember who it was. And I just want to point out, this is a painting William Blake made of uh, the flea. I don't know if you know the story, but he had uh, visions, and uh, the flea was an important vision for him. 
And uh, somehow it went from being a flea into this creature. And he believed, I mean, I mean, the guy sincerely said, you know, I had this, this was based on life. Let's put it this way. This was drawn from life. And the flea uh, told him that very, very violent, very dangerous people, God had decided to put them in fleas so that they wouldn't wreak havoc on the world. You know, they'd be just these little fleas that irritate you, that, you know, they bite you and you'd itch and stuff. And uh, the flea came to him as this apparition. But here's the duality of the thing. The flea also taught him to draw. William Blake claims that this flea came to him in a vision, said, hey, listen, I'm everything evil in the world. I'm in the body of a flea, but I'm going to teach you how to draw. I think that's an interesting thing. William Blake, again, uh, I, I love those poems. You know, in England, they're, they're sung to you at night, you know, to get to sleep. Uh, why anyone would, would sing a William Blake poem to a kid at night, no idea. I guess, you know, it's early trauma stuff. So I'm going to move on to, I'm going to move into art. I'll try and speed it up. Picasso, around this time, I was quite young. I went on a trip, field trip to London to go and see Tower of London, the Queen and Buckingham Palace. Me and my friend uh, went to the Tate in what I thought was a chance thing. And looking back, I think it was probably more complicated than that. And there was a show of late Picasso at the Tate. I apologize for these horrible images I pulled from the internet. Um, and I was fucking completely blown away by this thing. I, d I didn't know who the man was. I didn't know. I thought he was English. I thought he was a living Englishman, you know. <laughs> Thought, this guy's amazing, he's totally insane. And uh, I knew right then that whatever it was, you know, that he was, I wanted to be, definitely. I knew what it was to be an artist, but I didn't know you could also do this. Do you see what I mean? It was so uh, expensive. I want to talk about the Demoiselle for a minute, <clears throat> just because, you know, it's been used by the 20th century. It's like, you know, it's the moment when modernism, blah, 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 it leads to all these things. I just want to point out, it doesn't necessarily lead to anything. It's the most insane, fucked up painting in the world. And we shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't walk in and go, yes, this leads to synthetic cubism. This can lead to, and this leads to Hanna-Barbera as fast as it leads to synthetic cubism. Let's just, let's just stop for a minute and remember how bizarre this painting is. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, Sex Pistols, really big thing for me. I was terrified of them. When they did that thing on the boat where they did God Save the Queen, it terrified me. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I'm jumping around here. It's the first work of art uh, that when I was, like, say, a teenager, or I think I was a little older, uh, had a huge impact on me. It's The Silence of Duchamp is Overrated uh, by Joseph Boyce. It's part of a performance. And uh, I just liked it. I liked the look of it. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know who Duchamp was at the time I first saw this. Um, and I, I, I think it's an amazingly important work of art because it really does talk about the dilemma we're in, which is the silence of Duchamp is overrated. I agree with him. First sculpture I, that made me want to make a sculpture, I wanted to be a painter and I was horrible at it. And this thing was just the weirdest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I thought it was fantastic. And I still don't know why I like it. Uh, explaining pictures to a dead hair. Uh, you remember I'm 19 years old, um, I'm an idiot, and yet this spoke to me. And I think it's the, I, I'll go back and back to this idea that I think we shouldn't ever think that art doesn't have this possibility to get through to people. You know, why on earth? You know, I was brought up on the most stupid culture imaginable, and, and you know, the Bee Gees and, uh, you know, ABBA and all of that. And this spoke to me, you know, spam fritters, you know, horrible uh, stuff. And this spoke to me. Why did it speak to me? I have no fucking idea. But it, it's a brilliant thing, explaining art to a dead hair, you know. Uh, I go to art school in London, um, and um, I didn't go there wanting to be a sculptor. I, I, I was a performance artist at the time. That seemed like the, the work that made the most... I, I, sculpture was, I didn't, you know, I thought it was for rich kids and stuff like that. Performance art seemed really, you know, and I always looked at Nauman and I thought there was something incredibly true about this idea of what do you do in a studio? You know, what, what do you do? What, what is art, I suppose, is a discussion. Great piece by Bruce Nauman. 
Uh, Goya, I was in a period where uh, I was into performance art, I was starting to get too logical, and I saw a big show of Goya at the Royal Academy, and uh, you know, The Sleep of Reason produces monsters. Um, it, is, it was a show that really, really um, moved me tremendously, I've got to say. I'm at the ateliers, I go to Amsterdam, and uh, my teachers in Amsterdam were all conceptualized, Stanley Brown, Jan de Bitt, photography. And uh, of course, you know, I thought I was gonna go in there and be reading like, you know, text by Leotard, you know, 24 hours a day, and like, you know, reading the newspaper. And of course, the first thing they did was took us on a trip to, to, to Berlin and showed us the, the Pokemon freeze, which I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's the most incredible sculpture I've, I've really ever seen. It's, you know, man and animal and woman and, you know, women are killing men and snakes are eating people and there's dogs and just blew me away. That led me to uh, Michelangelo. Again, I want to point out this guy's meant to be, it's meant to be the, uh, you know, high pinnacle of something. It's the most bizarre sculpture you've ever seen if you go and see it. Uh, you know, people are like weirding out and it's like a Grateful Dead concert in the Academy. There's like, you know, American military people like lying on the floor photographing it. It's weird. It's a weird event. And it's a very, very, very fucked up sculpture. The proportions are wrong. The hair feels just like a lump of some like wig, Andy Warhol wig fell on him. Michelangelo, uh, a huge impact on me. Still, I'm not making sculpture at this time. I'm just like looking at this and going, wow, you know. A pair of uh, stairs that Michelangelo made, I, I, I think they're amazing. Um, Donatello, um, I think uh, this is an extremely uh, violent sculpture. This is the first time I, uh, in a very classical, very simple situation, I viewed sculpture as being extremely violent, extremely, like every inch of this sculpture feels massive and feels important. I want to point out uh, how weird this sculpture is too. Again, another like, you know, iconic Western thing. This is a naked, I don't know, 12-year-old boy in a fl floral hat uh, with, uh, and, and the bit I want to point out to you, and it, it's influenced me for years, and I think about it all the time, is how the guy's mustache goes over the kid's toe. You see the beard? At one moment, Donatello like sculpted that. It probably took him hours, and it's a deeply perverse thing. I mean, it's a really weird thing. The guy's mustache kind of goes over his toes. It's a brilliant. This is, uh, uh, I went again with the ateliers. We did this trip. Snow White was obviously, you know, the Wicked Witch was based on these. Walt Disney went to see these sculptures and was, they were in a strange bullet-ridden church in the east of, east of Germany. It was just as the wall came down and I, I've, I've never been so moved uh, by a sculpture. These sculptures were like waiting for me. I mean, you go through, you know, some strange old lady opens like with a big key, like from a, opens this thing and these things were sitting there and they're just amazing. And that was where I thought, you know, hey, in, uh, in material, you can make something extraordinary and it can live, it can handle time in an incredible way. These were made in 15th century and they just sat there, you know, and they were just incredible. So Thomas Schutter, he taught me at the Teliers for nine days. Uh, he came in for nine days and then got exhausted and left and never came back. But it was a fairly big thing for me. I started to make sculptures, figurative sculptures, and I thought they were a joke. You know, I, I was making them kind of as a joke. I was with Matt at the time, and we, you know, we thought, like, hey, this is hijinks. Uh, but he really, um, you know, he, he, I think he ripped me off a little bit, if I can just point that out at this moment. Uh, it's, I've got an audience, finally, I can... You guys are all thinking he's paranoid, but okay. But no, he really did. But at the same time, he really gave me a lot. He introduced me to Jacob Epstein and Gaudi Abreska. And he was one of the few people that, you know, when I met him, it was like, we were like, you know, how do we do? His thing is like, hey, how do we do this? How do we rebuild this thing? This is in the 90s. This was 94. And everywhere you went, there were like white uh you know, white things with text on, and there was lots of like video project projections and lots of like texts everywhere. And uh, <clears throat> there was nothing to look at. I guess it was cool. I don't know, it didn't mean anything to me. His watermelon sculpture was shown at the Stadelick and I thought it was just absolutely an amazing thing. 
So he introduced me to Boccioni, he introduced me to all this. I didn't know about these guys, so I, kind of, I have a kind of weird journey. I just think this sculpture continues to amaze me. It's pretty small, and it's just uh, so full of ideas. I mean, it really is. Uh, I don't think we still understand it. I don't think it fits into the Greenbergian modernist thing. I think it's just this amazing, crazy thing. Epstein, this, this was a big thing for me recently, probably about the um, last five years I've been ripping him off consistently, um, <clears throat> hoping no one notices, but I'm gonna come clean. The rock drill, you know, what a fucking insane idea this was. You know, make a sculpture, put it literally on a rock drill, and yeah, it's, it's so ugly and it's so weird, and yes, Star Wars ripped it off and all this, you know, sci-fi, but it really is uh, an amazing uh, thing. I, I still don't know if I understand it yet. I think it's so far, uh, I don't know, I think it's a sculpture that in 100 years people will get properly. I don't get it yet. Gaudi Breshka died at 20 something, uh, made like, you know, 19 sculptures. Um, and it's just, I think, you know, this thing's tiny, you know, and it's, it's just so powerful, you can't even imagine. And uh, <clears throat> Henry Moore, I grew up in Leeds, he grew up in Leeds, uh, didn't even know he was really from Leeds till much, much later. Hated him, hated his work, hated going to museums with big bronze things and stuff. Now I have to eat my words, I think he's uh, brilliant. Um, I don't need to explain that. Brian Cousy, you know, talk about like a gift, you know. Look at the amount of ideas in this room this is a photo he took of his studio, and I, I really think it's a discussion about the studio as a space. And uh, in the 90s, there was this thing of like, you know, uh, you, people didn't want to have studios. You know, studios was seen as a 19th century idea and uh, outdated and all of this. And I still think the idea of getting a room somewhere where you do your thing is an incredibly powerful uh, activity and one that should be defended. I think the artist and the studio is a really powerful, meaningful thing. Great sculpture, unbelievable. Kushner moved up to Davos, uh, which was kind of a doomed thing for him. Um, he was escaping Nazi Germany, really. And um, I just think this idea, he lived in this strange Alpine hut and uh, created this kind of utopic world for himself. And as, as I go on, I, I really think that's my aim, really, right? I mean, it's to make a piece of something magic, even in your tiny bit of space you can control, try to make something extraordinary. Uh, it's something, uh, this is a stupid slide to go to, this is Krakuti, the Northern Pacific, and I, like, I really hope if there's reincarnation, I come back in that tribe and I can you know, do that thing. I, I think it's, these images, if they're anything to go by, talk about such an amazing world, fang sculpture. Again, I discovered that quite late in the day. I, let's say I knew Star Wars before I knew this, and I think that's an important thing about my generation. I went to Belgium. Uh, I show this because it's the most accurate image of Belgium. Uh, it's a super realist painting by McGree, and it really, uh, Belgium, like, marked me deeply. And as you go through my lecture, you'll be like, aha, yeah, the guy spent seven years in Belgium. Shouldn't forget that. James Enser, <clears throat> amazing artist, terrifying artist, actually. Uh, I think what's interesting about this painting is you have laid out this incredible uh, group of genres from like, you know, 19th century portraiture through to some kind of weird pop, almost Philip Guston kind of a thing. And there's no, um, it's laid out there. It's full of possibilities, sorry. I'm interested by, things which give you possibilities. Um, Magritte, period Vash, uh, it's a little known group. He, it was his first show in Paris, and this was his uh, gift to Paris, was the most fucked up paintings you can imagine. He made them in like nine days or something like this on cardboard, and because uh, he, you know, he's angry with the French. And they turned out to be, you know, the most incredible uh, things. They're not the Magritte, you know, like giant comb and, you know, uh, night and day, this, this again accurately represents Belgium. It's a very realist painting of Belgium. <clears throat> so then I moved to California. Now when you say you live in California, everyone ima imagines strip malls and uh, 
you know, Hollywood and blah, blah, blah. But I live up in the mountains and it, it looks like this. And uh, I'd never lived in, in nature, could you say, before. And it's had a, a massive uh, impact on me. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's the most incredible place in the world. Um, this is Joshua Tree, um, which is in the desert out in California. And um, this thing is enormous. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever been, but it's this enormous group of uh, volcanic rock things. This is called Skull Rock. And uh, if you look at my Whitney piece, I realized uh, that, you know, I literally copied this stone as the head of that. I still don't know what I think about that. But I thought I'd come clean and, and show you where I got it from. This is a, a horned owl. Uh, and I had to kind of uh, mystical... Uh, thing I was in my uh, house and on the tree outside a horned uh, owl came and stared at me and uh, you know I didn't it didn't talk to me I think it was like the flea it didn't have that impact but it really changed uh, changed the way I thought about things this is a, a mountain lion I was recently stalked by a mountain lion as I was walking around and I liked the idea that it was going to literally like stalk me catch me and eat me in LA you know what an amazing thing you know and this isn't gangsters, I'm not getting robbed, I'm getting eaten. You know, it's an amazing thing about LA. This is not like, yeah, the guy, you know, got robbed. Uh, this is a P Pacific Diamondback. And they're like, there was a huge fire near my house called the Station Fire. It burned hundreds and hundreds of acres and all the rattlesnakes, I guess, moved from the forest into my house. So if you've ever seen snakes on a plane, that's kind of, and uh, <clears throat> what I learned about that experience is snakes don't really want to bite a human. It's a last resort thing, and they've been around forever, and they really do rattle that thing in this incredible way. And I, I um, you know, I did the show, uh, Dave Kudansky, it was called Serpent, and everyone presumed it was about the lacoon. And there was a big thing in art in America, like, yeah, he's deconstructing the lacoon. It was about this snake, this experience with this snake. Just want to make that really clear, which probably is connected to the lacoon and stuff like that. But uh, they're amazing creatures, and right now... Uh, my like weird experiences with nature are quite important to me, so I thought I would share them with you. So I'm going to go to my own uh, to my own work. If I'm taking too long, just tell me. Oh, what's going on? File. No view, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is Amsterdam. Now I'd been a uh, yeah I'd been a, perf a kind of a bad performance artist. And uh, I went to Amsterdam and I started making these things. Now, I can honestly say at that time, uh, no one was making sculpture. It was literally like um, turning up at a rock festival, festival, being an opera singer. Being at art school and being like, this is my proposition was so awkward, I can't tell you. And, uh, but I felt the need. I, I, I started making things and I was fed up of going to everyone's studio and they did found object things. And I suppose the, uh, you know, old Jasper Johns thing, take something, do something to it, do something else to it, ruled the roost, you know. It was like, you know, take some bizarre pop thing, pour paint on it, look at Ease Against Skin. Everything looked like Ease Against Skin in 1990s. It was like, oh, I've put these weird things together and blah, you know, it's crazy. And I started seeing it as a formula and I, I felt like people were hiding behind it. And uh, I didn't believe anything I was being taught. I'd been taught all this theory by anthropologists and linguistics. And at the end of the day, you know, you're born and you die, right? I mean, let's face it. And the last place on earth where you can be free or some concept of freedom is, is in an art studio. And I took that as a very radical act. And I felt like I needed to get back and I needed to see something that I, just I had made to know what I could do. I didn't want to, you know, it's a photo of this and I fucking blew it up and I poured chocolate on it or whatever. You know, it's like, yeah, but where are you? You know, where are you in this equation? Because, you know, I, I think at the end of the 20th century, we were in a cul-de-sac about what we're doing. So I'm not saying I've got the answer. I'm just saying I, I decided this was my correct way to act. And it had all these things in it, but I was making these sculptures, I was making one a week. I was barely sane at that time. I was having very intense hallucinations and uh, I hadn't done therapy or anything like that. And I was just making these bizarre, like, um, 
comic book freak sculptures, and I didn't really care about sculpture as an act or its history at that time. I was just making these things. Um, that's the piece I think Tom Schutter kind of ripped off, can I just say. Uh, it's a Michelin man um, about to be, I don't know, and, and I don't know, I don't know what he's doing, but he's wrapped in this weird thing, and it was painted pink, and it's, it's a really very, they were a very weird group of things, and I, again, you know, this is 1995, you know, everybody was showing photos and installations, and I, uh, I was, I thought that I would leave this behind. I thought that I was in Amsterdam and I would make these things and then I would go back to performance or something like that or do something normal or whatever. It's a sculpture that still to the day I, I think is really very good. And really, I, at the ateliers, I did uh, every... I, I've just... I, I'd already kind of figured it out that I just didn't know it. I think that happens quite a lot. You do things and you're not intellectually ready to handle them. Uh, this, uh, you know, whatever. This is called Red Turd. This had a big impact on someone like Matt Monaghan. Uh, we called it Red Turd. I don't know why, actually, looking back at it. But it was the first piece I made in clay and I cast. And uh, I was deadly serious about this sculpture. I thought this was a really super serious uh, sculpture. Now, I, you know, I just don't know what to think of it. It's like it's so bizarre, I can't. I mean, it looks like uh, American Werewolf in London just as the guy's turning into the werewolf or something, I don't know. This was a walking man, a very classical piece I made right at the end of that period in the Italians. I still, uh, still go back to this piece. I'm, I moved to Belgium. Um, I'd had a show uh, at the Stadelet Museum in Amsterdam, and I thought that I was just, you know, that went really well, and I thought that was just how I was going to go. I just thought, you know, hey, I'm, you know, you make things, and it goes really well, and you do shows. And then I went to Belgium, and... Uh, was about to embark on a 10-year uh, kind of hellish, uh, informative, let's say I learned a lot, but a really hellish interaction, interaction with the real world. And uh, I realized that being a sculptor, that there's a reason why there aren't many sculptors in our history. If you've ever sort of whittled down the numbers, there's lots of painters, there's lots of guys who do photography and video, but sculpture is almost an impossible thing to do. I just want to point that out. Uh, no one stores these things. I, I, if there's not a market, no one gives a fuck what you do to them. So, you, so there's a place in Belgium, uh, I'd like to point out, I did seven, eight years of work in Belgium, and at the end of that time, I was so poor that I couldn't afford to throw the sculptures away. I mean, I literally, you know, my landlord was like, you need to get out of here, and I'm like, yeah. And he's like, what are you doing with all these things? And I said, well, can you throw them out. He said, no, it's going to be expensive. You have to throw them out. And it was too expensive to, to throw them out at a proper skip. So I, what I did was I dug a hole in a field outside of my studio, cut them to pieces, and buried them in the hole. It's probably about 20 to 25 sculptures. And, um, and it was a very good experience for me. I'm still traumatized by it, but it was a very good experience for me. Because I suddenly understood, like, oh, yeah, Europeans really hate artists. Mozart died in a pauper's grave. Just think about that for a second. This is Mozart, you know what I mean? Like, we're not talking about an avant-garde guy. We're talking about Mozart. He's writing operas for the king, and he ended up in a pauper's grave. Rembrandt, not a hard proposition to understand the guy's got some talent. Ends up in a, in a beggar's house, you know. Europeans want you to die, is what they want you to do. And, um, and you know, I was happy. I was kind of happy to die, um, but I at least wanted to leave something. And uh, once I'd buried all my sculptures, I'd not, I wasn't leaving anything. Uh, so it was a, a big thing for me. It was like, you know, I can't die yet. It's all under a, it's in a landfill. So um, Matt had, had already been destroyed by, by Europe. Matt Monaghan, who did a talk here, he was destroyed and he was out in LA um, and he was, let's put it this way, um, having an interesting time in Los Angeles. Let's, let's put it that way. And he, his pitch to me was, you should move to LA. It's the desert and there's nothing happening here, but I'm here. <laughs> and that sounded like an amazing thing to me at that time was like, fuck, we're going there. It was like Gold Rush. 
And uh, so amazingly, and this is really true, me and my wife uh, put all of our gear on a boat in Antwerp. I mean, uh, we went bankrupt simultaneously. Uh, and by the way, uh, a friend of mine said, put some money in your sock. And I thought that was ridiculous, but I did it for fun. And sure enough, if you go bankrupt, put some money in your sock. They don't check your socks. They take your car keys, they take your credit cards, but they're not like, take your shoes off. So if you guys are going bankrupt as students, put some cash in your sock, it works. In Belgium, don't know about US. US might be like, hey, what's in your sock? You know, I could imagine that. Um, so me and my wife put all our gear, uh, which wasn't much, it was books and a few, few pieces of art, on a boat in Antwerp and bought literally a one-way ticket to LA. I'd visited for a day and a half, and my wife had never visited LA. And uh, we arrived there, and I, re I remember we stayed on Matt's, uh, in Matt's guest room. <laughs> uh, it was his bedroom, basically, is his guest room. And his bedroom was about the size of this podium. And uh, this is six years ago, and uh, we had, I remember Amy saying, well, we're okay, we've got like $500. We can, you know, we can do something with that. And um, it was one of the, I mean, I'd, I was, uh, oh, this is the last show I did in, in Belgium. Uh, Jan Hoot saved this one sculpture, this giant uh, headless piece. I worked on that sculpture for a year and a half and had a mental breakdown as I made it. Uh, thought it would be interesting to you. I decided to make these uh, uh, bottles, and this is a, a, a Genval beer glass. Uh, this was my last show in Europe, and it was at a museum, you know, give them credit. Uh, but I, I, uh, this is an enormous sculpture. I mean, it's uh, solid plaster. It probably weighs four or five tons. Now, I get this accusation a lot. Hey, you know, you've started making some money. You make big things now, huh? I made this uh, thing, which I'd, I'd never dare make that today. I mean, if you stand, you come up to the knee. And I made it in the most abject conditions possible. So I think I always had this need to make um, you know, big things. So I moved to LA, um, and this is the first studio I had. This is the first group of work. I uh, negotiated with a guy in, in East LA for this studio space, and we came to the conclusion I'd pay the guy 500 bucks a month. And he sort of said, well, it's, you know, it's really not enough, and blah, blah, blah. And I, uh, I then uh, realized shortly after I got to see, I couldn't pay the 500 bucks a month. A European would throw you out straight off the bat. An American, you pitch them with this thing of, I'm going to make this incredible thing, I'm going to change the world. And they're like, OK. I was rent free for eight months in, in East LA. And I still look back on that and think, you know, what an incredible group of people Americans are. Um, so I had this studio, which was a really very good studio. This is the first group of pieces I made. Uh, this piece was quite important. It was the first time I kind of poured plaster. You can see uh, I used a number of different elements uh, in one sculpture. Uh, you can see on the back, um, I used to pour plaster on the floor. I'd make a drawing on the floor, pour the plaster and harden it and pop it up. And uh, the plaster in Europe didn't pick up the drawing. And in America, it was a thing called Tough Cow that I could buy. And it printed, basically, all the drawings I made on the floor. And this was a big thing for me. Suddenly, the drawing and the sculpture were one, something like that. This is a piece, I think, I, I, the first time I realized a figure could be kind of a pattern or kind of a complete abstraction. Uh, this is a clay piece. Um, if you can imagine, I made the clay, and it went over a piece of wood. And I think um, I was starting to think about how a form um, relates to space. This was some of the early moments that I started to think about um, you know, the inside of a sculpture, the exterior of a sculpture, and the action of making a sculpture. Uh, this again, this was a piece of clay made over a box. I made a box, I built the clay over, and I removed the box and um, cast it. And um, you know, this is, it was my first inclination of you know, negative space, you know, which I'd gone to a good art school 15 years earlier, they would have been like, there's a thing called negative space, and I would have learned about that. Didn't learn about it, so I, I was, so a uh, big, big moment in, in my life, and Mira's sitting here, so I, I really want to have a love poem to you. Uh, I didn't know you'd be here. So um, <clears throat> by some miracle, um, 
you know, we were sort of bumping along and, uh, you know, Matt's idea that we'd make this, you know, fantastic community in LA was not really panning out at that moment. And um, it was starting to look a lot like Belgium. You know, my wife was working as an extra on Tavis Smiley, uh, which is not her dream in life, let's put it that way. And I was doing construction in Marina del Rey, which is also not my dream. And I was working at night and... Um, and then Amy got pregnant, um, we had no health insurance, which you can imagine, you know, in America, that's really something. And by some miracle, um, you know, uh, Don and Mira, and I guess it was Jason, came to my studio at like some crazy hour, like 5.45 in the morning, you guys were flying out at nine. I'll never forget this. And I, I'd installed a group of works in my studio in darkness because we had no electric light at the studio. And then I had this visit and um, in many ways, um, it was, it's important to talk about it because I think, um, you know, uh, artists need somebody who gets them. You know, I know what it means to really do the, uh, you know, um, almost like resistance fighter thing. I, I've got that covered. I can, I can do it. I can live on. I'm like a cockroach. I can survive, you know, amazing uh, trauma. But... Every now and again, you need someone to go, hey, I think we get this, and, and go with you. And I, I do, I think that was the first time in my life that someone came, and, and, and I, you know, I was convinced it was going to be a horrible studio visit. And um, effectively, uh, you know, they said, you know, go for it. We're doing the show about LA art, and uh, why don't you just make some stuff? And... Um, it was a really tremendous experience. It was a really life-changing. It started making me think there was some order in the universe. Um, and, and that's why I want to talk about, I think you, you got to, um, you know, if you can find people who get you, it's quite an important thing, I suppose. I don't know if did that make any sense. So I, I started making this group of work for that show, and it was a show about LA art. I'd been in LA about nine months. So I was about as convincing an LA artist as like, you know, Winston Churchill or something. But this is again a crazy thing about America. If someone says you're in an LA show and you're from LA, everyone in LA is like, hey man, you know, you're an LA artist, by the way. <laughs> and I love that. I think that's again, you know, that's why China won't take over the world economy and all of that, you know, because I think that um, malleability about this culture is extraordinary. And L.A. was really good to me. So this is a sculpture I really made for, uh, for that show. And, uh, and at the time, uh, I was in a studio building. There was Aaron Curry. There was Amy Bissonis. My wife is a painter. And uh, Aaron, um, already at this time, was probably giving me sort of, you know, every sculpture I made, about 20% of it came from Aaron. And I was starting to just accept that and go for it. And this sculpture was a really big sculpture for me. Um, um, it, it was the first time I really talked about energy and I really talked about this kind of, um, I, don't, I don't know how to explain. Um, it just had a complete life of its own, this piece. And, um, and uh, this was the work, you know, I was still crawling out of this fucked up time and this sculpture was like, hey, I, I really want to do this. It was the first conscious moment I thought, hey, I want to be a figurative sculpture. I'm going to really go with it. I'm, I think it's, it's uh, something I should really try and tackle. And there's, there's real room in there for me. Um, this led to, to another, uh, the first bronze piece really I ever made. And you can see the relationship to that sculpture. Um, I'd started to... Um, I really like the idea of a monument, uh, and uh, a monument in a way to nothing or to nobody other than to the, to the manifesto I felt needed to be laid out. I felt that sculpture um, could give you this experience, a, a subliminal, uh, powerful emotional experience. You could move around it and it would change and it would uh, remind you that it was an object that was made for no reason, which if you look in the world right now around us, you know, there's no object around us that's not got a reason. And uh, that's um, the world we live in. Everything has a reason, and sculpture doesn't. Uh, it's an object that has no 
no meaning, and particularly when it's really big and in bronze, it impresses that idea on you very strongly. And so these were kind of monuments to, to nothing other than my desire to make art and my desire to reconnect to some kind of figurative tradition that was a fantasy also, wasn't real. Uh, this is a piece that's very important to me. It's probably still, you know, uh, you know, the piece that I would want to have in my house or something like that. So then I, I started playing with uh, flat forms and um, in a weird way really embracing uh, this kind of Kurt Schwitter's period and going back to it. And, you know, uh, I think that, um, again, the liberation of my generation was uh, every position felt ridiculous. Um, you know, being a, a video artist, being a performance artist, being a, uh, whatever it was you were doing, to me, it started to all feel, it was just about where you thought you could kind of push, push things. Uh, so these, th th this led to a, a group pieces that were really very uh, planar. This is an aluminum piece I made. Um, uh, again, really with the idea that a sculpture could kind of unfold and break down in front of you and um, would carry thought in it, you know, uh, form as thought, thought as form, this kind of idea. Uh, masks are a big thing for me. They're usually rejects um, for uh, sculptures. They're heads that I've made for a piece that never find um, a piece. And then I start to hang them and then I start to see them as things in their own right. Uh, they're printed in this case. You know, I make a drawing on a board and I pour plaster on it and print it. It's almost like a cast of a drawing. And um, they're quite important to me as like, um, almost like, Something between a sculpture, a drawing, a painting, I don't know. Um, it's another one that's quite important. I, I've kept this one. Uh, the, this is a, a clay mask. It's the um, first time this kind of strange coin form uh, became kind of between an architecture and, a, and um, I don't know. I actually, looking at it right now, I don't know. But it's, I, I see it as a face, somehow, as a, as a mask. Is another mask, it's quite important. Um, the piece that's going to be shown in City Hall, uh, this was the original head for it. Uh, this is a show I did uh, in Los Angeles and um, quite recently. And um, I really, I wanted to leave no doubt in people's minds about what I was trying to do. It was my first show in America and I, I really decided to leave no wiggle room all for like, well, you know, the guy makes things, but at the same time, don't worry, you know, he's cool or whatever. So this was a, a show where I first made pieces that I really saw as almost like follies. And this uh, piece is very, very big at the front. I mean, it's like 14 or 15 feet. And it's a real, uh, it's a real Frankenstein um, type of a thing. And it, it was... Um, in a weird way, all the issues that were going around in my head are manifested in this sculpture. And it's a bronze. It needed to be a bronze. It was very dangerous as a plaster. I mean, it would fall on you and all of that. I mean, it was very vulnerable. So I started to get into the idea of you could cast something that didn't have any real life in the world. And the bronze would take something that was totally untenable and, and make it into this monumental thing. That was very exciting for me. So you could be very vulnerable in the sculpture and it would still be this thing. You had to walk around, you could imagine, you know, it was a very, very weird show. And I suppose I was kind of laying out uh, a series of positions in this, in this show. And um, you could see it, it was made, uh, the, the, the way it's made and uh, the form it takes are completely intermeshed. Uh, that I, I really believe a, a, a good sculpture kind of shows you how it's made and talks about how it's made. I think if you try and hide how an object is made, it's a, it's a problem, I think, for me anyway. Uh, this was the first wood carving I, I ever did. Um, it's, um, yeah, kind of, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't talk about it. It's a series of uh, the heads that, that I thought would be for sculptures ended up in, in a kind of um, a, a genre in of itself. I started really being... Uh, interested by the idea of, you know, the pedestal and how a sculpture sits on it and how uh, a portrait uh, activates in space and what is a portrait. And they kind of almost 
these pieces kind of give me confidence to do the other works, could I say. They're like my talisman. It's another piece, um, quite large scale, uh, clay mask on a carved wood base. Um, yeah. This is, a, if you like, from my classical period, could I say. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's weird, you know, I, I can walk into the studio and I suddenly will make an a astonishingly classical piece of, oh, and I don't really plan that. I, I kind of am starting to let go. At this stage, I'm starting to just let it hang out. And um, I think I'm just really interested how, uh, number one, how the body appears, what it's like to look and live with human beings. Um, I'm very fascinated by that. And how you then, um, how can I say, express that and uh, Giacometti talked a lot about his trauma was between, you know, looking at a model and making the mark. He talks about this a lot, the space between reality, I guess, and the representation of reality. Cezanne talks about it quite a bit, but Giacometti really dramatized it. And I, I still think that that space between, you know, you existing in the world and you looking at the world and you fantasizing about the world and all your childhood stuff and all the ways you've been and how you then manifest it, that space is, is very complicated and very magical. And I stand as a sort of defender of that space. And, and you know, again, I, if, you know, if your bag is another thing, fine. But I think that we, we have to defend that right in art. It needs to be there. And I think, uh, I still strongly believe, I may have said that earlier, you know, you know, you're born and you die and we still don't know as Gauguin said, you know, where you've come from, where you're going. You know, we don't, we don't know that. And I think um, th that's, for me, they're like monuments to being alive. You know, I'm, I love being alive and I love looking at things and touching things and seeing things. And I want to sort of re rejoice in that, can I say. Does that make any sense? This is another classical period piece. Uh, it's a very, very large work like 18, 19 feet, uh, I called it the astronaut because it was like it was going to space. I imagine this piece, like, you know, if uh, another civilization came down to Earth, I would give them this or something. That's how I saw it. Don't know what that means, but it was, again, a very uh, intense uh, meshing of flat form and modeled form and um, the idea, again, of a monument. I guess I was still, and I'm still to the day, jiving off the piece I made uh, the bronze I made for, 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 uh, for Miami. Um, this is called Baby. I show it because it's a precursor to the Whitney piece. Uh, you know, I was having kids at the time and I think that um, that had a big impact on, I started uh, looking at the way a baby uh, is born and the fact that, you know, they learn to walk and they learn to do things exactly like every other kid for the last gazillion years. It's not like we've evolved, you know, it's not like kids are born and they're like, yeah, I know about this walking thing. I need a computer and, a, you know, they still go through this crazy kind of bodily lunacy. I was watching this and, and thinking, you know, I'm a, I'm a really odd guy, but I started wondering, you know, if artists play out that thing, you know, this almost like crazy basic, like, hey, you know, everybody, we're alive, you know, and we stand on two feet, you know, wow. And the world's like, yeah, whatever, man. You know, but I still think we have to keep reminding, like, God, isn't it crazy? You know, I have an erection. What does that mean? This kind of stupid, almost childlike quality to artists that's quite important, I think. And so I started making these babies. They were like these giant sculptural babies, you know. First gate I ever made. I, 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 by now, I'd started to make some money, and I bought some land. Uh, my model for that was Neil Young. You know, Neil Young had gone out to Topanga Canyon, so I always thought it was a really cool thing. So I bought uh, land in Tahunga, which is very different from Topanga because in Topanga there's musicians and cool people and celebrities. In Tahunga there's aging hell's angels and animals that want to eat you. And, uh, and I, I own this, uh, I bought this land um, from this very strange old woman who, uh, had some development had been trying to buy the land off her for years. And um, 
the fact I was English really appealed to her. And she was like, oh, hold on, you're from England. Went down into a basement and came back with a Nazi helmet with a bullet hole in it and said, my husband, uh, she was like 90 years old, shot a Nazi and brought this back. What do you think of that? And I was like, deal, you know, I'll buy this house. Uh, she was famous for going to get her mail, uh, which was just, you know, it's a little fucked up driveway. She'd go to get her mail with a shotgun in the hand. She was 94. And uh, this experience of buying this land and living up there has had a big influence because I started thinking I'd make my own sculpture park, David Smith style. I've never, I haven't quite got the money to do the sculpture park yet. So right now there's this wild, fucked up land that's about to like catch on fire at any minute because you know, we live in a high fire zone. Uh, but I make these sculptures imagining that they would go on my land. And I'd like there to be a walk. I'd like you to make a walk on my land and I'd like you to go through these different gates and see these different things. The um, thing that's weird about the art world is um, when it goes good, everything you make has to get sold. And, um, you know, from all my life wanting to sell things desperately, suddenly when you can, you're tremendously sad about selling them. And uh, you realize suddenly, you know, you get this chunk of money and it, you know, pays for gas and it pays for your groceries. But, you know, you've given this thing, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> so um, I don't know really what I mean by that. There's a mixed blessing in it. I mean, I haven't had to bury these things under the ground, which is, I'm a step up. But still, they go away from you. And, uh, you know, if I'm talking to art students in here, that's an odd dilemma. And I uh, just want to point out, Brancusi, everything he sold, he made a copy of it. So if you've ever seen, you know, those iconic images of his studio, well, I just showed you one, if, if I remember. Uh, he made, remade everything. And I'm, I'm in a moment where, um, you know, my dream before I die is that I would make this sculpture park. And it's on the outskirts of LA, about 25 minutes from downtown. And I'm just really hoping I could make an extraordinary thing out there, you know, that there would be room... More and more, that's why I'm making my work. I want to go to talk to, about the idea of friendship. I met this, this uh, artist, Aaron Curry, and um, on the way to Miami to come and, again, interesting thing. Uh, Aaron was in that show. He was becoming an L.A. artist also. He's from San Antonio. He's like as far from an L.A. artist as you can imagine. Uh, he's not cool. He's not laid back. You know, he's one of the most fucked up people I've ever met. But he's absolutely brilliant. And I want to point out, as an artist, uh, we really need other artists. And don't ever get seduced by the idea that you're alone and you should have this career that's just you and that you know, you're know you this island. Uh, lots of my best ideas come from these friendships. You know, Enrico David in, in London, uh, who uh, taught me an enormous amount, much more than any art school. Uh, Matt uh, taught me a great deal. I taught him a great deal. Uh, Aaron really um, continues. This is, this is the one friendship that didn't explode. You know, I still really love him, amazingly. I think he likes me still. I'd, I'd like to believe he still likes me. And we're, st we're still friends. And um, we did a show in Texas uh, out in Marfa, which is, you know, high modernist mecca. You know, everyone going there wants to see Donald Judd. They don't want to see this. I can tell you that right now. They're going, they're traveling, you know, gazillion miles to not see that. And I realized, uh, and unfortunately all these groups, you know, they're going to Marfa and they're going, God, it's so fucking beautiful. And, you know, it's this magical fucking, you know, image of, and then th they were obliged to come to this space because there's two things to see in Marfa. I don't know if you've ever been there. There's the Canati and there's the ballroom. That's it. You can eat pizza, that's the other option, or go to the post office. So they would come to us. And I then realized that the battle I was in was a bit more serious than I'd anticipated. I had this stream of baby boomers coming in and um, pulling this face that was like, it was like they'd, you know, had like a custard pie thrown in their face. It was like disgust mixed with trying to get, look for a door. You know, there was like this thing of like, huh? You know, and, and, and you know, me and Aaron kind of had a name out there. You know, they're like, no, maybe these guys are okay. And they came into this. And I, I want to talk about, about it because it was, I think, still probably one of my best shows looking back. And me and Aaron made the stuff together in Marfa. 
um, uh, it was kind of an, an operatic, dramatic thing. It's some of the ugliest things. You know, I never thought I could make stuff this ugly. I thought I'd gone past this. This piece in the background is called Felty. And, um, uh, you know, there's a very, very strong alcohol element to this show. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you're in the desert. It's like there's these, no one tells you about Kanati. It's also one of the most fucked up. Marfa's a horrible place. And I'm guessing Judd was a real asshole because he was like, I'm going to move to this fucked up place where there are these like, you know, 60 mile winds. It's so dry, your eyeballs, like, you know, you can't close your eyes because you're so dry. Like they dry out your eyeballs, this place. And, um, and uh, you know, you're completely mad out there. And uh, this felty at the time, I was convinced I'd had a massive breakthrough. You know, I, th I thought, well, Jesus, the civilized world is going to come to me and go, you're the guy that made Felty. And um, iconic work of art, you know, well done. It's, I thought it was like the Demoiselle or something. And, uh, you know, Aaron didn't believe it was an iconic work of art, so I proceeded to be a real asshole, really mean to him because he hadn't seen the light, you know. And, and then he was really mean to me because I hadn't seen the light on his project, his Felty. Uh, I don't know if you see this, like... Uh, fucked up glue and there's, there's numerous stains of various things. That's not done for effect. I, I was hoping you wouldn't notice those things. This piece got uh, reproduced in Vogue. I just want to point out, it's interesting how the world, you know, everybody loves this felt piece. You know what I mean? I, I came back from off and, and tried to burn it. And, um, you know, I have lots of people come to my studio, are you going to make another felt thing, you know, one day? You know, and it's, I, I, I guess the story is, if you make something absolutely horrendous, it's often quite, quite interesting. Um, and this piece came out of that. This is some of my first abstract arts. Uh, Aaron says they're like Masonic, um, yeah, what, what would you say, Masonic? Don't know, they're scary, definitely. They're like these weird Masonic images, don't know what, quite what they are. This is to show me and Aaron, I, I, I um, I think um, it was uh, the one experience I've had recently where I really saw the power of art and I saw the power of being with an artist and working with an artist and kind of hating and loving each other and all of that. And I just want to say, even though it's a really torturous thing to be in a relationship with another artist, it's worth it. I mean, obviously you're looking at the show and thinking, no, it ain't worth it, but I'm telling you it's worth it. These are some fantastic pieces by Aaron. These are called Leaners, they're aluminum. And he painted on them. This is a large wood sculpture. I, I just couldn't, you know, you get sent the images of your own work. You don't get sent. So I'm sorry there's not more of Aaron's, but you can kind of feel it was a really powerful show that we then followed that show. Uh, we did kind of part two in Berlin. Um, and this was another gate. Again, I told Amy, I'm not going to sell this gate. I'm not going to give it to a gallery. This one's for the land. You know, no way I'd let two go or one go. And then Gordon arrived and like, can I take this gate to Berlin? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem, let's do it. Uh, I'm really proud of that gate. I like really love it. And um, everyone was like, you know, don't do it. You know, it relates to Baselit. It's this terrible image for you and da da da. And my, my answer to that is, yeah, I, I, I think that's okay. Um, we were having a child at the time. It's kind of I'm jumping around in the back. And uh, I started being unafraid about being very emotion, very emotional, painfully emotional in my work. And I really hold these gates dearly. And they mean a lot to me. I suppose, you know, they're, they're stupid. I agree. And then there's some references in there that are really uncool, can I say? Like, really fucking uncool. I know that. But they're, they're, they're beautiful. They're, they're like great to climb on and drink near. I noticed when we were in Berlin, we'd all sort of crowd around that gate and drink. Uh, this was show, it was part two of the show. This piece will be shown, the bronze piece will be shown at the show uh, here, statuesque. I kind of made this piece for, for that show. Um, it's another bronze work. It's uh, a piece that couldn't, really couldn't survive as a plaster. I mean, uh, you had to cast it. it was, it's like a group of pieces. And the, the thing that's great and, and great and troubling about this piece is it's um, really chopped up, collage-like, 
Uh, I don't know if you noticed, on the side there's a hand coming up, because it originally had like, you know, contrapposto thing, and it really is like, it's a group of reject sculptures like stacked, and, uh, and it, it's a piece that's about the absolute borderline between something being a figure and something just being a pile of clay and something standing up and something falling down, something, and, and uh, for, that, for that reason, it's quite a troubling piece. Here's a show, I did this series of shows, um, oh, it's probably a bad idea, but I took on like five solo shows in a row because I was scared about having a child, and, um, and I, this is in a railway station in Milan, and um, it was a very weird show, I, I think, it was kind of, a, yeah, it was a weird show, but I, th I think it wasn't bad. I mean, this piece I really still like. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I include it because it's got that bronze piece. So, uh, to the win why, why was the transition? Oh, yeah, so I'd made this head on the right, and um, it was kind of like a, um, like a skull animal, I would describe it as. And... Um, and I came out of that show and I got asked to do the, to do the Whitney Baniel. They didn't visit me, they didn't... It was like a very odd thing. It was like this strange call. Will you be in the Whitney Baniel? You know, it was like, it was opening like five days later or something weird like that, you know. I definitely wasn't a planned part of that show. And they said, would you be in it? I said, sure. And then I got a call from ben uh, Francesca Bonami and he's like, well, uh, will you do something really crazy? And I said, yeah, what, what do you mean? And his answer was, here are the, he gave me the dimensions of the lift, the Whitney lift. And I thought it was a brilliant thing. It, it was a, an amazing response to get from a curator. He said, I said, well, what are you imagining? And he said, well, the dimensions of the lift are like 114 by 94, you know. And I was like, okay. And um, this piece I made uh, after this series of shows, and um, I'd never shown in New York before. Um, I'm from a generation that uh, really feels New York is like the center of the world. I've noticed that students I teach are like more impressed by Berlin these days and stuff. And I'm like, no, it's still New York. You know, it's like Jackson Pollock was in New York. You know, that's... And uh, so I, I made this sculpture really as a statement. And I tried as much as possible um, to not be afraid and not... not um, it was a kind of summation of those things I'd learned in those last three or four years, five years or whatever, whatever it was. Um, um, it's quite, um, yeah, I don't actually, um, yeah, what am I talking about with this piece? I, 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 it's quite brutal. Um, it's quite, um, uh, I think it's quite, um, I don't think you're left in any doubt as to what I'm trying to do with this sculpture. I didn't want people to come in and go, yeah, I don't really know what it is you're saying. I wanted them to go, you know what, fuck this guy, or take it on board. That was kind of my thing. And I still think, you know, this plurality that we've got going on is great and really dangerous. I think it's still important to stand for something. I still think it's important to annoy people. I still think it's important to have a position, even if you know it's going to be uncomfortable. Uh, just at least to give someone else something to vibe off of. Because at the end of the day, as artists, um, this thing can still not survive. It can still die for, you know, 300 years and stuff like that. You know, you get dark ages. Well, and, and I think, uh, you know, for me, here you see the ironwork, the rebar. Um, for me, how a sculpture's made and how it's attached and how it exists is very, very important, increasingly so. One hand's made of clay, one hand's uh, just the rebar. Uh, so this leads me to, to the show that's on right now. Um, uh, you can go and see it, so it's very stupid to show images of it, but um, uh, this is like a pulling apart of, of things uh, for me. And, uh, uh, and it's also about Things that, you know, if you visited my studio, you, you, I've always kind of made these weird things like spoons and objects that you could use and tables and stuff like that. I've always made that. And um, I, in a way with Gordon, we started you know, um, pulling those out and thinking, yeah, let, let's show that. Let's show that a sort of state of becoming and a series of possibilities. Going back to the Brancusi image, 
I think the greatest thing you can offer as an artist is possibilities. And, um, you know, you can't be everything to everyone. You know, I'm not, I don't know if, um, you know, I don't know who I really help actually with this. But I, I always have this image of like, if you can offer this idea that hate can be done and hey, there's, you know, this is my take on it, something like that. So the show is, um, uh, strongly plays off the idea of abstraction and figuration. I still think that's our great debate. No matter where you look, we're still trapped in that. You know, what does that mean? Where'd you go with it? You know, uh, doesn't take uh, a great deal of thought to imagine that abstraction could really be seen as a folly one day. Do you know what I mean? 400 years from now, they were like, can you imagine? They just poured paint on shit. These guys were crazy. Uh, you know, I like to imagine those kind of moments. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, there's this thing called performance art. Kind of was like movies, but shit. You know, I, 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 sometimes I like to dream about that idea. You know, I think we're so enmeshed in this thing. And we think, yeah, you know, this is this history. And, and so um, I like to sometimes make shows wondering about that. Uh, this sculpture is great because every single person that walked into my studio, be they the most like you know uptight person in the world, they'd walk and put their hand in the sculpture and then talk to me. It's very weird. Like I'm talking about shippers and stuff. Like people who work for a shipping company would walk in and put their hand in. Be like, are we moving this piece? <laughs> I'd be like, could you remove your hand from it, for example? <laughs> like everybody wants to put their hand in it, and I like that. It's like a wishing well. Or it was like this kind of odd, you know, you almost feel like you could whisper a, a request into that thing and it would echo back at you and answer you or something like that. And Aaron pointed out it's like a bong. I don't smoke uh, dope, but yeah, it does kind of look like a bong. And, and I suppose uh, it's like a bong baby toy. Uh, and, um, you know, I stand behind it. Let's put it up. I believe we need more bong baby toys in the world. You know, stop making war, make odd bongs. So, yeah, again, the coins, uh, the coin motif, you maybe know, it goes through this time. Uh, I decided to just, you know, make the coins. God damn it. You know, why, should, why would I mess about? Uh, the coins we used to sit on uh, at the studio and eat lunch off of, and um, they got really horribly stained by, by, the, by, by uh, salad dressings and stuff like that. So I cast them in aluminum. Um, and um, they're like, uh, I see them as kind of a sunset. Uh, they're like, they reflect light, and we, I started putting them at my house. So at uh, a certain moment, my whole house was covered in coins, and it's really very beautiful when the sun comes up and goes down. When I die, come and check it out. My foundation will be up and running <laughs> by then, and, and there'll be these coins outside the house, and you'll be like, yep, yeah, it was good. The coin thing was good. But in this show, they really work, you know, they're, 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 it's like I say, they're pulling apart. Um, yeah, uh, here's, here's a gate, it's the final gate. I, I, I don't think I'm ever gonna make another gate. I have the strong feeling I'm not going to. I realized you really can't. And you really, you know, it's not fair to put that on the world, you know, because people have got to move it around and, you know, it's kind of a rude thing to do to the world. I gotta tell you, is make a massive gate. And uh, so I'll probably never do them again, but this, this one again, it's like, um, you know, it's my uh, love song to Matisse's backs, you know, that here at the moment, they're just amazing things. And also to, uh, in a weird way, Gauguin, you know, I, I loved all those sculptures he made for his hut, you know, be, there'd be like things like be mysterious, be mad, you know, he'd do these kind of crazy things. I mean, he's also, we now realize like a pedophile and, you know, probably a terrible guy, but I did like those pieces and, you know, this idea that art would live with you and that you would have it as part of your life as an everyday experience. I, um, I really believe in, and deadly seriously, I think that your life is enriched by seeing a work of art. And there's lots of people who are like, well, there's too much art being made and blah, blah, blah. There are too many McDonald's that's the problem. There are too many nuclear bombs. You know, everyone's like, well, this Picasso went for $100 million. It's obscene. It's obscene uh, when you look at what America spends on bombs. I think if I had $6 billion, 
I'd buy a $100 million Picasso in an instant. You know, I just don't have the $6 million or whatever. That's not the problem. Do you know what I mean? That's not our problem. Art is not the problem. You know, the other stuff is a problem. I want to make that case, you know. Without art, what do we really have? I want to point this out again. We have medical science, which is great. Uh, but still, it runs at a profit, and it's kind of dodgy because, you know, they tell you, eat this, and it'll be good for you, or take this drug, and then we always find out it's not, not the case. They're like, no, don't eat it. You know, now you've got to do this. And um, uh, art's the one thing. I think if, like, an alien army invaded and said, okay, you know, you're, you know, you're a terrible group of people, you know, what is it you did that was good? I, I really do think you'd say, well, we've got Mozart, we've got, you know, you'd look at art. You know, you wouldn't say, well, IBM turns, you know, $400 billion profit this quarter. They'd be like, yeah, whatever. You know, that's, again, this fundamental discussion about what we are, you know. And, uh, and I, I do think that it's the one thing, you know, you look at Mozart, you listen to Don Giovanni, or you, look, you read Shakespeare or whatever, uh, and, and it's something you can say. Jesus, you know, humans are, are worth it, you know, for me anyways. I don't, does that make any sense? I'm not, I'm not feeling a big receptive thing, but uh, that's my, uh, and I'm trying to add my 10 cent to this thing. Uh, this is the most recent piece I made. It was uh, like a diptych to the Whitney piece. I made them at the same time. Um, had the shipping date been different, the Whitney would have had this head. Uh, it was like on it and off it and on it and off it. They're like, uh, they're like brothers, these two pieces. And this piece will end up in the show, uh, it's the statuesque show. And um, again, the coin motif, uh, you know, in Irish culture when you die, particularly gypsy culture, they, they put a coin on your eye. I don't know, do you know about this? And uh, when my granddad died, uh, his friends put coins on his eye, and I always thought it was amazing visual image and, and a brilliant story about you know you can't take them can't take coins with you, but then again if you know they look good on a dead on a dead person's face, the dead person's like why are you putting fucking coins on my face? But you know it's a brilliant thing, and this sculpture is uh, again a kind of mutant uh, struggling to be some kind of heroic thing. Um, uh, as you walk around it, um, the back side of it, you'll see it in the show, it's like a black mirror. And um, um, it, it's quite uh, powerful as a thing. It, it's completely contained and it has this tremendous energy. You walk in a room and it seems to each time like almost move. It's one of those sculptures from the corner of your eye. It's like moving and watching you. And I've had a couple of people that work for me say that. And I think uh, if you can imbue a material, an inert material, with life and energy, it's, it's very interesting to me, that debate. And it's probably uh, really the summation of the last you know, five or eight years' work, is like, how do you take an inert material and make it, give it life, give it energy, try and make it reflect on the conditions that you're in? Something like that. Uh, so I'm back to the beginning. Sorry. So that's that's it. I think it was enough. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. We uh, we're we're running short of time, but if if there's one or two questions, we we could probably uh, occupy Tom for a few more minutes. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, thanks. Thank you. I'm so, so there's, there's like this this issue between originality and appropriation in your work. Yes. And in the beginning of the lecture, you used things like rip off and copy. Yes. And towards the end, you used like homage and collaboration. Yes. So I was wondering, like, what changed in you, or what did you have to do to kind of change the I way got, you looked I, at I that? got more knowledgeable. Um, I got more knowledgeable, and uh, I started to have respect for things. Uh, I started to, uh, I think a big, a, a big thing for me is uh, dropping, you know, in the 90s, uh, you had to be kind of cynical, uh, meaning um, 
I was scared about things. I really thought it was over. I really thought making art in a room and doing that thing had no place in the universe at all. And so I, I was more ripping off. I was taking things slyly. I was sneaking them in. I was being cynical about it. I was being knowing. I was being um, disrespectful to history because I was scared about it. And as I've gone on, I'm, I'm, I'm more respectful. And I'm, um, and I'm less scared about the future. Uh, and I'm, I'm stronger, you know, as a person, if you like. And uh, I'm willing to... Um, I, uh, I, I guess I've also started to understand that, you know, work like... Um, uh, the, you know, art is incredibly fragile. I mean, even the really good stuff where the guy, the person's died and it's in a museum, it's still a very fragile thing. And, um, and I've started to be more respectful about that. So I would say there's a much more loving relationship to those things, a less uh, arrogant relationship. You know, people would say to me, hey, you know, in that piece, there's, there's a little bit of, say, whatever, Picasso, and we'd laugh, go, ha, yeah, you know. Kinda, you know, it was this kind of, yeah, but not really, you know, really, I'm a cool guy. Now I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I, I hope so, or I, I, you know, I hope I haven't overtread that line. I'm a little bit softer um, in the way I look at the world. I think it's much more, we're in a much more fragile situation than I think we realize. I think because you can look at an image in a book, you presume it's very strong. Do you know what I mean? But it's not. It's unbelievably... Uh, art is something we have to keep cherishing. And I met Rudy Fuchs, uh, who was a fabulous curator. And I, you know, I met him at the ateliers. I was 24, and I presumed every curator was like that, because that's what you like when you're 24, like, this is just a curator, you know. And he kept talking, you know, we have to really fight for this. You know, you have to really believe in this. You know, you're going to go to hell for doing this. And I was like, no, I won't. I'll be a YBA. Yeah, fuck you. You know, I'll be... I'm going to be cool. I'm going to be in Saatchi and all of this. And that didn't happen, you know. I mean, I, I really suffered. He was right. I suffered for my, for my beliefs. And I also realized that it's very vulnerable. You know, we, we got to, uh, like I say, not much energy is really given to art. You imagine it is. You know, you look at the auctions and you say, well, but there's really not. It's still a very periphery activity. And it's still a very vulnerable activity. And... Uh, and artists, uh, what they leave is still uh, very malleable and very dangerous to the world. It's still a very radical uh, thing. So I, I guess, uh, you know, not to go too long on it, but I think you have to, I'm more respectful now, you know, and, and I'm more respectful about the things I'm influenced by and I'm, I'm more knowledgeable about, about it and I'm... Uh, uh, hopefully I'm a bit more um, thoughtful about it is what, you know, is what I'd like to be, you know. So in that way, yes, I was much more, I was like a punk, you know, in the way I raided things. And now I'm, I'm still a punk, but I'm, I'm a more thoughtful punk in a weird way or something like that. You know, I, I, I really, uh, I can't believe that the 20th century, I can't believe that during these gigantic wars and this fucking Great Depression and all this, the people made art. I mean, I was in a, uh, I saw a Medigliani painting recently and, it, and I'd forgotten what a great artist Medigliani is. What an incredible uh, sense of line and color and all of this and how radical those paintings still feel and how weird they are. And you know, you, you think about that guy, he, I mean, he really lived a miserable life. I mean, full on miserable. You know, when you're trading a painting for drink and stuff like that, that's not some St. Mark's Place hipster you know, I'm at Cooper Union, listen man, give me, you know, a dollar. That's a really horrendous uh, thing, you know, and, and uh, I think we shouldn't forget that, that it has to be fought for and it has to be defended. Thomas Schutter, bless his cotton socks, kept, you know, really kept saying, you know, you really have to stand for something, you know, uh, you, you know, you really have to fight for this, you know, it might not. You know, I, I think, you know, being German probably, and I was taught by a lot of Germans, I think they were very aware of how dangerous things get if you're not respectful about, you know, what, what you look at and how you feel and this kind of thing. It took me a long time uh, to get there.
Does that make, does that kind of answer it or? Yeah, definitely. Thank fine. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The overall effect is one of emotional nakedness. Emotional. Nakedness. Yes. And um, it's a fascinating contradiction. Yeah. And um, also it's make, it's so mortal, the figures are. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more yeah, about um, that. Uh, it should be pointed out um, that I uh, view these sculptures as, uh, like I talked about the Magritte, as realist. I mean, I don't look at people, uh, especially if I'm close to them, I don't look at them and see a photograph of a person anymore. I used to, but as I've gone on with this thing, I, and, and it's, a, it's a really dangerous thing. You, know, you start making things, you put a nose on something in your studio, and you're a goner. I mean, that's it. I guarantee you, you go in the studio and you make a face and you're lost. That's it. You're, you're like in deep trouble. Try and get yourself out of that. Because somewhere deep down, you're like, I'd love to make that face again, but I hate it. You know, this thing is what's happening. And uh, so uh, I, I started looking at uh, bodies and I started looking at the way I referred to them in people's faces. And if you look at someone from behind as opposed to from the front, and if they talk to you, you know, what you start seeing, actually, if you're open to it. And uh, you do see kind of um, stylistic stuff. You know, uh, you don't see a photograph, I think, if you stop yourself and really stop and slow down and really look at how a person presents themselves to you. You don't see this, like, you know, five foot four, person, you know, in jeans and blah. You see this weird animal that's like freaking you out or attracting you and all of that. And if you get into that, um, you start realizing there's a stylism to humans, you know. Do you know what I mean? Like we're actually not that different from one another. And I don't mean that in a uh, John Lennon imagine kind of way. I mean, we literally look a lot like each other. And there are weird defects that you can see in people and weird ways their eyes are and stuff and the way, the, the way they posture. You know, I've watched my daughter do postures that are my father's. Now, she's never met my father. So what's that? You know what I mean? She's literally got mannerisms that she's got from my dad who she's never met. And I'm fascinated by that, that kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? So the idea that I would sit down with someone and draw their face and go, that's what you look like. Uh, uh, means less and less to me. I mean, uh, and so in that sense, the faces are uh, as much a sign or a mannerism as, as the knees or the feet of the sculptures. You know, the sculptures are based on reality. You know, it's like a movie based on real facts, you know, that kind of thing. My things are based on real facts, but I don't, I don't think that... Um, being in too strong a gestalt with reality uh, allows you to make art. So uh, they kind of, um, I found that truth for me, if you like, is based on a kind of elaborate uh, lie about how you look at things or an elaborate accepting of truth, which is when you look at someone, you bring all of these fantasies to them, right? You know, you can meet a stranger and you talk to them for an hour and you're already projecting all this weird stuff onto them. You know, it's not really about how they look, but they start to look. I mean, I may be alone in this. That's what I do anyway. You know, if you spend quality time with me, you know, that's what I'm going to do to you. But I think if, you, if you're conscious, you know, the way someone presents themselves is very weird. And if you walk through a city, uh, which we have a unique in, that, in New York, I was really struck by this today. You know, there's this mass of faces and this mass of bodies and this mass of images, and they come to you. It's totally bizarre. The idea of stopping someone saying, I'm going to take your portrait and I'm going to draw you is ridiculous. It's kind of a cipher. And uh, so I don't think that if you make something that's like a mask or an abstraction of a face, that it necessarily has to not be emotional. I think it can be very emotional. I think it can be maybe more emotional, probably. So I've found that if I get the right distance from the world, I can be really emotional about it. If I'm too close, I hate it or it scares me, or whatever it is, you know. So I guess you create kind of distance with which you can be honest about how you feel about it. Does that make sense also? 
Okay, yeah, great. Uh, <clears throat> I have a desire to ask quite a question myself. Go right ahead. Uh, I don't know, are there people who are like art students in this thing? Or is it mainly like other pe kind of people? <laughs> I'm just wondering if there are art students in, in this house. There's like one, okay. <laughs> I'm well, talking to like you. There are, you know, like there are a few. I did this lecture for you, by the way. Um, everyone else can leave. We're going to talk. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, there's one. I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to ask a question. I can ask you later. Yeah, there's a few. Uh, yeah, should I ask a question? Yeah. I wonder, are you guys, uh, you know, are you angry? Are you scared? How are you seeing things going? Can, is that's a general question, but how do you feel about embarking on this thing? Weird question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I shouldn't have asked, I knew I shouldn't have asked. Well, may, maybe, <clears throat> maybe we should um, sort of table that question for the post-lecture uh, yes. post conversation. Um, I think Tom's taken us kind of on, on an in incredibly rich, generous, varied uh, trip from Yorkshire and miners' strikes um, to the canyons of LA and, yeah. and Sorry the about the miners' uh, strike thing, guys. <laughs> no, that was You that know, was I, watch, I watched uh, Greece doing this shit and I just thought, <laughs> yeah, I've got something to say about that. So I tagged and, it onto this talk. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you know, don't blame and, and, you for any of that. <clears throat> and you know, even sort of here to the the streets of New York City, and of course the parks of New York City, where we're going to see Tom's work in in a couple of weeks' time. And I think, um, I mean, even seeing them on the big screen, the impact of Tom's kind of monumental bronzes, he's, he's disappeared, <laughs> um, is um, is amazing. So did I just? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I stole my shoe. Like so, um, so yeah, and and I think ultimately what I thought was very moving tonight was uh, if the coin is sort of a motif in Tom's work and and the current show, uh, he also kind of showed us that strength and fragility are two sides of the same coin. Oh, yes. and so thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.